Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Michigan State University Extension Virtual Breakfast. My name is Jim Islib. I'm a crop production educator in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I'm hosting uh, the sessions today. Dr. Jeff Andreessen can't be with us today, so we will not be having a weather update. Dr. Chris Defonso is going to join us to finish out the meeting with a talk on early season insect issues. Or oh, no, a discussion about European corn borer. <laughs> corn borer, come on, but European corn borer. <laughs> Thank well, you, Chris. Uh, I will give you a weather report. It rained, so there's your weather report when Jeff isn't there. Um, yeah, so I've been keeping the handy BT trait table for the nation for the last probably a dozen years. And in the last month, we have the, the first case of adding European corn borer to this table. Uh, as far as resistance to BT. Um, many of you are driving, so I don't, you know, you don't know how to get the table. Just when you're at your office, Google handy BT trade table and Texas, it sits at a Texas A&M site, and the, the most recent copy is always there. So that table has just been changed in the last few weeks to include European corn borer resistance to BT. And um, this is really significant because BT corn was developed to control European corn borer. That, that was its original task, and that was 1996. So we've had a really good, good run before we've had the first case of resistance. And the, the toxin that the resistance is to is Cry1F, which is Herculex 1 trait. And the location where it was found was in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, which are the maritime provinces in Canada. So if you drive to Canada and you drive essentially as far east as you can go and hit an ocean, you're probably in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. That's as far east as you can possibly go. So the significance is that this is the first time that corn borer uh, has had a resistance case develop. This was at the end of 2018. The fields were pretty significant, as I understand, and then in the bioassays in the lab, I was told that um, they were, you know, highly resistant or 100% resistant. So people that are driving can't see this, but people that aren't can see that I do have a few pictures up here that are from the, the fields in Nova Scotia. And when corn borer gets bad at the end of the year, like August, September, this is second generation and they've gone inside the stalk, of course, and that stalk weakens and plants begin to fall over. And in the picture that I'm showing, every single plant about halfway up has a hole drilled into it. And you can see right near uh, where the leaf is joining to the stalk that there's some corn borer frass. Corn borer poop or frass looks different from other species. It's not uh, like big chunks like you see with armyworm or western bean cutworm. Uh, they bore into the into the stalk itself where there's whitish sort of tissue and as they bore they push that frass back behind them and it sort of comes out of the hole and it's usually whitish and kind of it can be very powdery almost like a carpenter ant sort of damage and uh, in this case every plant has this so you can tell this was the resistant population and the, you know the question I, you know, I'm getting is, you know, why did corn borer resistance develop? Well, the easy answer, the first thing the company told me was, well, you know, it's been since 2001 since we've had this trait in the field, so it's no surprise, and that's kind of true. But the other thing is, the more interesting answer is that in this area in Nova Scotia, there were still uh, growers planting single trait BT hybrids. They were still planting Herculex one, and the reason that that's important is that we started off with single trait hybrids like yield guard or herculex and it had one bt in it the risk of resistance to those hybrids was was very high because all the insect had to do is overcome one bt toxin and they were golden they they were resistant and that's why we had this large 20 percent block refuge so as time went on you know, anyone using BT corn has transitioned to the pyramided hybrids, like a, like a smart stacks, uh, where you have, or, a, you know, BT double or something. So you had more than one BT in there. And it's much harder for an insect to be resistant to multiple BT toxins at the same time. So the risk of resistance was lower. And you were allowed to plant, uh, the, the, the the companies were allowed then to provide the lower refuge 5% in the bag. Now, as part of that transition, what you're not seeing is that the companies were supposed to phase out the single trait hybrids. That was part of the deal. 
because those single trait hybrids would be sitting out there as resistance generators and they and uh, that that was part of the plan and obviously there are markets where that did not happen and uh, again if we if we think about where's Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island they're at they're not in the Corn Belt they're at the kind of the butt end of the Corn Belt as I always say and there's probably not a lot of uh, hybrids available to them that may be the better kind of hybrids. So you can imagine that they're still selling those, those single traded um, hybrids in those kind of areas. But it makes you wonder where else are single trait hybrids being planted and are they and where? And you could imagine Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, upper part of New York, upper part of Michigan perhaps, the upper peninsula, uh, northern Wisconsin. You know, I kind of wonder. And it's very hard to get this kind of information. But um, if you are dealing with customers that are, for some reason, we still have single trait hybrids out there, those single trait hybrids are bad in a way because there are resistance generators. So I thought I would just open it up to questions, discussion about corn borer. It's something we don't think a lot about, um, but we, sh we need to be thinking about it now. Chris, this is Paul. In, yeah. in mid-Michigan last year, I saw corn borer for the first time since almost the 90s, and some of the pictures that you showed uh, I could have taken. What strategies, and I, and I think we're, we're seeing an increased acreage in, in non-GMO corns for different certain markets, premiums, and, and uh, increased acres in organics. What management strategies might you suggest for us, for growers, to, to monitor this pest uh, where a threshold especially for that second generation. Well, you're right. We have some premiums for non-GMO in certain uh, dairy sectors. There are more people thinking about organic. And, the, and we've had so low corn borer populations for so long that many guys were interested in maybe switching back to a non-BT to save money on seed costs. So there's more non-BT acres out, out there. And that's fine, but if you're going to do that, you have to go back to 20 or 30 years ago, how did we manage corn borer? And the first thing is you, you have to know that they're there. So you either, uh, cor corn borer trapping is difficult because you can't just use a bucket trap like with the other, um, other pests. You have to use a heliothis trap, which is much more expensive. And, and I am trapping for corn borer now, and maybe some of, some of the others of you are, and we'll put that onto a map. But the bottom line is you have to walk fields. So early planted fields, fields that got in really early and made it in will be attractive to first generation corn borer and later planted fields will be attractive to that second generation corn borer. And there are good thresholds, good, good scouting plans to go into fields and see if you have uh, corn borer in them. I think first generation is probably a little easier to deal with because you have a whirl and you can actually go over that field and get insecticide into that whirl cup and that uh, tends to have better control. Once you hit second generation, the corn's taller and you need to have a way to get in there and do a spray before they bore into anything. Once they bore in, then it's impossible to control them. Chris, a question from the chat box. Can you give us an idea when corn borer flight and first emergence will be this year? So corn borer, in a, in a not ideal, in a normal year, corn borer probably would have started to emerge already. I have traps that are on campus. That's my limit is I'm on campus, and I've seen no flight whatsoever. There's been nothing so far. And I don't know who else traps. It's, again, the trap is not a cheapo, s simple trap like we have for Western bean and army worm and cut and cutworm. It, these, um, you need a big bell-shaped trap that has to sit into a grassy area to attract the males in, and so it's not, it's not as easy to do. Um, so I have seen no flight so far. We're going to go out and check. I have a light trap running. We've uh, seen one in a light trap, and that was yesterday. So central Michigan, we're just, just starting. I'm just starting to see the first corn borer. So are your colleagues in, uh, throughout the Midwest, are they trapping for corn borer? Are they seeing kind of the same thing that maybe we can get a heads up? When well, can Canada, of course, since the resistance issue has hit Canada, they're very keen on trapping. Um, we've, we, uh, how can I say this? The Canadians have 
uh, put their trapping network open to everybody now. So we have probably 15 states and provinces in it. It's called the Great Lakes and Maritimes Trapping Network. I, di I didn't want to talk about it because I can't figure out how to get my data in yet. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit more complicated system. But once we get it up and running, there will be a lot of traps uh, from Ontario across which will match our latitude there. So, and, and I'll put my data in. And if anyone else is trapping too, has you know the big bell-shaped, I, I suspect maybe some of the vegetable people might, might be. But we should have some trapping data available. Chris, another question from the chat. Will corn borer be attracted to other crops in addition to corn? Yeah, cor corn borer is different from western bean. It has a, it has a much broader host range, um, including dry beans. Uh, it'll go into vegetable crops like potato and tomato. There's actually two corn borer strains. If you're going to trap, we have the Iowa strain in Michigan. I've never caught um, the, the other strain. There's a Z and an E. E strain. The eastern strain um, seems to be much more vegetably tied. Uh, it has, uh, it, it's, it's found a lot more into various vegetable crops. But our, we have the Iowa strain here if you're going to trap. And I have seen that in dry beans. I've seen it in, even in wheat, trying to develop in wheat. Um, so it, it has a very broad, broad range. Um, there is a new corn borer guide that we just got published last year. It's uh, available, uh, available at Iowa State, and there's a whole chapter in there on other crops that corn borer attacks, including hemp, back from the old days, uh, cotton, a whole, whole bunch of other crops. Hey, Chris, this is Bruce. I was just curious. Did you, do you think that these BTs, um, we know we used to use uh, BTs for control of corn borer and other pests in there. Are there other options for the organic guys that... Uh, maybe wouldn't be impacted, or maybe these aren't impacted by the, the, the uh, crime one. Uh, let me think about that. Well, if you were going to use a BT, like a sprayable kind of BT, that's not Cry1F anyway. It's going to be more a Cry1A something, like, like if you use a di, di, Dipel, um, there's a bunch of different uh, related BT proteins within that compound. There's more than just one. So I think those would still work, but they have to be like exquisitely timed. You know, you got it, it, it for organic folks, they got to be walking those fields very religiously and, and timing very, very well. And sometimes, you know, in a year like this, we may have corn borer emergence. It may not be kind of like a like a real tight emergence period, it may be it may stretch out, and when you have those stretch outable emergences that go over several weeks, that's where it's really hard to time something if you're th trying to make one one application. Um, there's some other stuff that would be like a spinosad kind of compound, perhaps something like that. I, I'd have to actually delve into it a little better and look it up, but there there are some options, expensive, and they have to be timed well. Any reports of army worms in the state that you've heard, Chris? I have not. I, I've gotten a few pictures. They weren't of army worm. I've seen some black cutworm. Um, they're out there. I think they're pretty isolated. Um, I'm going to look at a cereal leaf beetle field today, which is down by Mason uh, in wheat. And what else have I? And, and then uh, Mike Staten submitted a sample yesterday in the diagnostic clinic that had everybody looking at it. And that looked to be seed corn maggot with a few other issues. That was in soybean. So it's been, and, and we've seen it, a, Asiatic garden beetle in some high numbers in some isolated fields. But it, it's, it's been sort of hit, hit or miss as far as insects. There's no great theme right now. Chris, with the, the, the change in weather and planting, how is that going to affect western bean cutworm? Because we're very concerned about that with grain quality and mycotoxins and ear rots. It, it, they, it, their emergence may be delayed a little bit. And remember, they, they're going to key in on fields that they like to lay eggs on, so those, those pre tassily sort of fields. So I think... It, I don't think you can make a broad statement about it, but I think you could look at your neighborhood and say, oh my gosh, I'm the only field that got planted and none of my neighbors got planted or something. Or, you know, how, how, 
however it goes, when, when you start to see flight, if, if you're a pretassel field in an area that has a history, uh, your field may be quite attractive. That said, you still got to go scout it. Because I could also see down in Bruce's area, for instance, where there's been a lot of rain, some of these fields sat uh, with saturated soil for a long period of time. And insects, you know, they die in saturated soil. They can't breathe. So these pupae that are stuck there, you could actually uh, for, think that, that there'd be some mortality from that. So it kind of goes, it, it's all going to depend on how your field syncs up with flight, and then that flight may be delayed a little, a little bit too. So you're saying sink or swim, right? Yeah, if you want to say that, yeah. Hey, Chris, is there any, what's the RX for uh, uh, seed corn maggot? I know we've had a lot of green material that's been uh, turned down just recently and planted right into it. We know that. Well, the, the field that Mike, I don't know if Mike's on or not, but the field, uh, it, there was a treated and an, and an untreated, meaning I guess it was a seed, seed treatment, um, both of those samples had seed corn maggot feeding along with some other issues. It, it looked like it wasn't just all seed, seed corn maggot. Then wherever they fed, there was some pathogens went in there and maybe some herbicide issues. It was just a smorgasbord of problems. But, um, you know, kind of rotting material, weeds, residue rotting. I mean, th th this year, who knows? I mean, it's just, and, and these plants were making, once things make it out of the ground, things need light. We, we need like sunlight and uh, some, some su uh, two sunny weeks would cure a lot of the problems out there right, right now. Uh, and things will grow out of damage a lot of times as long as they're not cut off. Seen much for slugs or no? I haven't had any slug calls, but that's amazing because I think it's just the fields weren't planted yet. This has got to be like a slug fiesta out there in some, some of these fields. So Good comment. That addresses one that came in the chat about slugs. With okay. cold, wet weather, do you think slugs could be an issue? And we just yeah. heard it's a slug fiesta. Slug fiesta. But then, you know, I think Jeff said it was supposed to dry off here. In a, in a, well, he keeps saying it's going to dry off, but it hasn't yet. So if, if, any, if anybody uh, can't find that corn borer guide, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll send you a link right to it. And uh, I sh should have put that on here, but I didn't. Keith Mason has indicated that he checked the Enviro Weather uh, site and saw that the uh, European Corn Borer Prediction Tool has emergence beginning in East Lansing June 9th. So okay, that, that's yeah, good. That, yeah. So my one male that I caught was an early bird. An early bird. He's, he's, he's all by himself. He's single. He's in a, <laughs> in a world of hurt. Good. I hope he stays that way. Okay. I want to wish you all a very good morning and a good day.